Um, hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us on your Sunday afternoon. Um, my name is Natalie, and I'm the Programs and Exhibits uh, Assistant here at the Arlington Heights Memorial Library. I'm also joined by Jennifer, my colleague, who will be helping out with chat and other behind the scenes things. This program, as you probably know, is part of our One Book, One Village this year. And the book chosen is Braiding Sweetgrass, Indigenous Wisdom, Scientific Knowledge, and the Teachings of Plants by Robin Wall Kimmerer. To learn more about the book and other upcoming programs like this one, you can visit our website at ahml.info slash one book. And with all of that out of the way, uh, I will hand it over to our presenter, Natalie. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining me this afternoon in my humble kitchen. Uh, and we're going to talk about one of my most favorite subjects, uh, foraging safely and ethically. Um, I got into foraging about seven years ago. Both of my parents had stage four cancer and it was going to be a really rough year. And I knew I needed to do something that would help me kind of handle all the big emotions that come up around that. And being outside, walking around in the woods always settled me. So I made it a point to do that a lot. And um, at the time I was living in Rogers Park in Chicago, which is a great neighborhood. And it's filled with, it's a very vibrant neighborhood with a lot of wonderful people. And I met a survivalist um, and uh, at a local restaurant. And he's like, yeah, I take people out and show them what they can eat. Do you want to come sometime? And I said, yeah. And I went with my younger son and we wandered around and we were in this valley and he said, what do you smell? And I said, I smell onions. And I looked down and there were little nodding onions right at my feet. And it just, there was like a little zip in my brain, like this, there's food everywhere. Um, and it was so phenomenal. And it was something uh, I thought I didn't know anything about. But as I started to forage more, I realized that I did when I was little. Um, I just got this from my backyard. This is wood sorrel. You all might be familiar with when I was a kid, we would eat this. Sometimes people call it sour grass. Um, and I'm like, oh, wait, I we would get together in daycare and sneak off and behind the swings and eat this little bittery lemon grass. Uh, and then the more I foraged, I'd have memories of my grandma who lived on a farm taking me away from the area where the crops were into where the wild blackberries were and showing me how to pick those. So this is something that regardless of who you are and where you come from, we all come from people that foraged. Um, a lot of us that connection might have been broken. Um, for some of us that might be something that is still alive in our families. Uh, but foraging is, is a human way that we get food. Um, but there's a way to do it so that it does not disrupt the plants. Um, and we can do it in a way that's safe and ethical. So we're going to dive into that. Um, so maybe, maybe Natalie, if you can bring up that, uh, how to practice ethical foraging, we're just going to kind of go through this page really quick. And then I'll kind of dive into it in a little detail. Um, and I believe if anyone is interested, you'll be able to get a copy of, of this. So these are the basics. Know the plant, get at least two forms of identification, know the plant's story and life cycle, know who else uses the plants, know the soil, know the land, focus on foraging invasive species or non-native species, and focus on regener regenerative foraging. Well, I can't say that word. Um, so you can you can pull back from that now, and we'll kind of dive into this a little bit. So the first one, foraging is pretty safe. If you follow the first basic rule, making sure you 100% know the plant before you put it in your mouth. Very simple, like be absolutely sure. I know, I know that's a dandelion and I feel 100% comfortable eating it. So that is where you really, first and foremost, before you're ingesting it, you want to know the plant. Um, and so that's a good place to start. When I started learning um, with my friend, my the survivalist that then became a friend, I studied with him for um, about four years. And then I went on to the Resiliency Institute, which is in Naperville. There's a lovely uh, ecologist, Pat Armstrong, that teaches a year-long program on 
wild edible foods, which I highly recommend. Um, she is an absolute treasure. Uh, but what I would do is pick one thing all day and I get to know the plant really, really well. And then I started to be able to follow it through the season. So really you don't need to know everything. If you know one to three plants, you will get a lot out of that. So slowing down is kind of key in the beginning. So do I know this plant? So knowing the plant um, and so making sure that it's, it's something that is okay to eat. So when you're in the space where you're starting to learn and you're not sure, I always say at least two, if not three forms of identification are great. I'm a big fan of a book, um, a person and a phone app or a, an online forum and not uh, just using one. So the, if you're not sure if it's an edible plant or not, two to three identifications. Um, the things like picture this and seek are great, but they're not, not super accurate. Um, I had seek up on my phone, which I believe is put together by iNaturalist and National Geographic. And I have a leopard print backpack and I accidentally took a picture of it and it told me it was a lizard. So, you know, play around with it. It's okay to use those, but don't make it your only form of identification. Um, and in a little bit, we'll dive into some good books to have. Uh, and then if you have like someone like me or people you know that know their plants fairly well, make sure you kind of connect book person and some sort of online identification forum or app. Um, and then you're going to get a more well-rounded idea of what that is. So that's always a good place to start. Um, the other thing to know when you start eating wild foods is they're very nutrient dense. Uh, we don't tend to them the way we do foods that are in the grocery store. So they, they have a lot in them. A little bit goes a long way. So I always say start slow um, and don't eat a ton. I've learned that the hard way with certain foods like uh, daylilies, uh, the flower pods are delicious, but I ate a little too much and got a tummy ache. So just see how you feel, just like anything else. You might know if you eat a lot of Brussels sprouts, you're going to get gas, things of that nature. So start small and build up. So maybe you're feeling nervous about eating the plant. You've, you, you know what it is, you've identified it, but you're like, how am I going to do with it? So you can do this. Some of you, if you've had allergies, know this well, um, but the universal, I forget if it's universal standard or how you test the food out. So I have my wood sorrel here. The first thing I'm going to do is just put it in my mouth, put it there for a minute or two, and then <laughs> take it out, wait 24 hours. Um, and then if I have any sort of rash, scratchy throat, weird feelings, that's not the plant for me. 24 hours goes by, I can put the plant back, chew it up a little bit, and then spit it back out, wait 24 hours again. Nothing happens, no rashes, no uh, tightening of the throat, itchiness. I can go on to the next step. And that is chewing and swallowing just a teeny bit. If that works out well, then you can feel pretty safe to consume. Um, if even that's making you nervous, you can also start with taking the plant, kind of crushing it up um, and then putting it on your elbow and rubbing around and waiting about 24 hours and seeing if anything happens. So you can take it slow and experiment with that. If it's something, some people will feel more adventurous. Some people want to be more cautious. So that's something you can keep in mind. So knowing the plant, getting that identification, then you want to go beyond that. And that's where, again, slowing down is really important. Really get to know the plant. It's life. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I just saw this. Um, Elbow, yes, just around the elbow area and see if any rashes or anything come up here. Um, but get to know the plant. Um, what is its life cycle? Is it threatened in your area? Is it a native plant? Is it a non-native plant? Um, who else relies on that plant? What kinship is the plant in with other things? Uh, and that's gonna help a lot. So um, foragers get a really bad name in particular where we will, a lot of people will learn a plant enough that it's edible, but no respect to the plant itself or um, its life cycle. So one of the biggest things which you've probably heard about is wild leeks or ramps. 
they have a very long life cycle and they're very popular. They're popular in more expensive grocery stores and at restaurants. So people will forage them and they can't reproduce faster than what people are taking. Um, to the point now where, especially I have friends on the East Coast where people are eating you know, ramps in really high-end restaurants thinking they're getting this like super clean wild food and it's actually from polluted riverbanks because people are just grabbing whatever they can. So really understanding the plant and should you be picking it? Um, ramps might be extremely prevalent in one area and not in another. So when we dive into the honorable harvest, those are things to keep in mind, but really just get to know that plant. Like not just, can I eat it? Yes or no, but where does it reside? Who depends on it? All of the, just fleshing out that plant more. Um, Knowing the soil, this is another big one. Uh, you wanna make sure you're foraging in an area that um, hasn't been aggressively sprayed with um, pesticides. Uh, a good sign that that's happened would be if everything looks really burnt or scorched. Um, the other thing is uh, factories, places like that. If you do something like there's a, a plant called yellow dock or curly dock and you can eat the roots and the leaves and the seeds, and but they they pull lead out of the soil. So if you are in an urban area where there's a high lead content in the soil, you might want to think about what part you're eating, um, or if you are foraging in your own space, if you have patches of of green where you can um, to get the soil tested. Um, People will go back and forth on this too. And some people will say like, yeah, we, you know, it can't be much worse than what some of the stuff we put on it. So to your discretion, but also just, you know, think about the soil in the area where you are foraging at. Um, so knowing the land, this is important too. Um, just really uh, learning about the space where you're at for a couple reasons. Um, in Illinois, it's illegal to uh, pick in uh, forest preserves and you will get a ticket. Um, and I've spent a lot of time talking to people that work in the preserves over the years um, and trying to build good relations because I, you know, people will say like, oh, you shouldn't teach this because people will go in. And so some people are really painstakingly trying to be land stewards and create a, a healthy environment for the plants. And then someone comes in and just boop, they're taking everything. And so this is when we get back to the respect. So you want to know about the land and maybe avoid tickets. Um, a good person to follow if you're interested in learning more about foraging is um, Alexis Nicole. She goes by the Black Forager. Um, and there's also a lot to that with who gets the rights to forage what and where. When we uh, forage with respect, we will diminish some of those concerns that people have. Um, but knowing that land will be essential, not just for the soil and if the land is clean, but with respect um, to where you are foraging at. Oftentimes, if you have neighbors or areas, they might not mind you foraging at all. Uh, one of the places I forage is an urban farm that my friend runs right up the street, and he is very happy for me to come in and take some of, of the lamb's quarters or the things that are growing in abundance that he's not particularly planning on using, um, but we have a reciprocity and a relationship established with that. Um, and then also to know the land in that we're, where we live and we're living on Potawatomi land. And so another great way to um, build a new relationship with plants and also um, know how to have more reciprocity with the plants is to find and look into indigenous ways of land stewardship. And so braiding sweetgrass is, is my probably most favorite book, but we'll, is if you've all kind of, maybe a lot of you have dove into that, we'll already show you that. But learning land practices and ways to harvest the diminish harm will go a long way. Um, and so that with regener regenerative forming, <laughs> foraging, I cannot say, regenerative today. Um, so what I'm meaning by this is when you pick is not to, gen again, just aggressively take. So if you remember, if for those of you that read Braiding Sweetgrass, when she's talking about foraging and harvesting wild leeks, she's very slowly assessing what's there. She's 
getting them out very slowly. She's not just ripping them up and she's looking at where the best place to pick is. So this is, again, it's another slow thing where you're, you're kind of pulling back and saying, um, how can I take this thing, but also make it so that I am not disrupting the ecosystem it's residing in and also making it more challenging for um, other, other animals and insects that depend on it where I've taken it all. Um, so uh, maybe what we'll do is go through the honorable harvest and dive into that. And then I'm gonna take a break and look and see what questions have popped up if there are any. So Natalie, maybe if you can bring up the honorable harvest. So this one is again, a, a list of maybe things to think about um, when you are foraging that Rob and Wall Kimmerer have put together. They're not a hard and fast, um, they're not laws per se, but these are things that when I'm foraging and, and if you're foraging ethically are important to think about. Um, and so just to go through them, the honorable harvest is know the ways of the ones who take care of you so that you may take care of them, introduce yourself, be accountable as the one who comes asking for life, ask permission before taking, abide by the answer, never take the first, never take the last, take only what you need, take only that which is given, never take more than half, leave some for others, harvest in a way that minimizes harm, use the harvest respectfully, never waste what you've taken, share, give thanks for what you have, um, been given, give a gift and reciprocity for what you've taken, sustain the ones who sustain you and the earth will last forever. And so we can pull back from the slide now, but these are, are things that I think about when I'm foraging and um, was taught through um, working with other foragers and ecologists as well. Um, I'm constantly always trying to take classes and study and learn from other people. Um, but so we've dove into some of this already, really knowing and understanding the plant and not just going past like, oh, that's edible, I'm gonna grab it. Um, there's another, there's a great herbalist, Howie Bernstein, that talks about plant lust, which I definitely felt when I first, you, you, your eyes are just, you're like, oh, there's everything, there's all these things and I could eat that and I could eat that and I could make this and you get kind of overwhelmed. And so a lot of what the Honorable Harvest is doing is intentionally slowing you down so you're not taking too much. So really knowing that plant. So if uh, leeks are absolutely delicious and if when um, I did, when I first started foraging, we also talked about how they were endangered. And so oftentimes if we took anything, we would cut one leaf and leave the bulb in the ground because, uh, and only take enough for dinner and not more than that. But had I not learned that, I would have been grabbing a ton and, and pickling them and harvesting them, not knowing it takes seven years for them to reproduce because they are so delicious. So that um, knowing the plant helps, helps you quench the plant lust that sometimes can come up. So introducing yourself, this is always interesting. When I, when I do classes with kids, they have no problem doing this. Um, and for adults, sometimes it can feel a little bit goofy. But for me, I introduce myself to the plant. It's another way to slow down. So if I see a nice patch of red clover and I start to think, oh, I could use that, I stop and I say hello to the plant and I say, hi, I, I'm Natalie. Um, you all look very beautiful today. And I would like to harvest some of you to dry to make a tea. Um, and then when I do that, I have to think, do I actually want to do that? Can I do that? Do I have the time? So taking the time to introduce myself also makes me think about just because I can take this doesn't mean I should. And do I have the time to actually go through the process that we'll dive into in a little bit to tend to those plants to make them so that I am actually eating them. So uh, that's a, just a simple thing to do is just acknowledge you're there and you're interested in, in taking that plant, but um, why? And so asking for permission, this is another one that's interesting that kids will often get it. They'll say, if the plant looks sad 
or if the plant looks sick, you don't pick the plant. So though, you know, um, one walk I was on, a kid pointed to some uh, bee balm that had mold all over it. And he said, this is a sad plant um, and I probably should leave this plant alone. So um, partly is that, and then some will say, They'll, they'll poke you, they'll scratch you, or they might not want to come out of the ground. And so sometimes this can feel a little uh, more uh, out there for people, but it's really, really just slowing down and looking and saying, you know, is this something I need? How healthy are these? And um, uh, do they want me to pick them? And, uh, and again, in braiding sweetgrass, uh, she will talk about plants kind of like, hey, um, and, and it's a hard thing to convey, but I've definitely had that feeling where you're walking and they're like, over here, hey, it's me. Um, I, there's a ton of us, you can come get some if you want. And, and so that can, even if you just stop and slow down and think about why you might want that plant that will help you in that kind of situation if, if you don't feel like you know if the plant is saying yes or no or not, but just slowing down and thinking, do I actually need this? Um, never take the first, never take the last. This is also really important. Um, I was in central Illinois over the weekend camping and um, I was out hiking around and I saw a beautiful dandelion um, in flower and it was one dandelion. And I, I you know, was, I, that little pop of yellow we're losing because we're moving into fall. And I was like, oh, there, there's a little dandelion flower, um, but it's the only one. And dandelions are a huge source of food for pollinators. They come up first in spring and they last all the way till now. So there was no way I was gonna take that because I, there's beautiful flowers everywhere. There's things that I can make for myself, but for our pollinators, that's that one thing. So when you're coming across something, if you see one, you might just pause and wait and see if you see more later. So if I'm looking for things to harvest, um, when I come across the first patch, I'm usually gonna go past that and kind of look around and see and make sure there's enough. Um, because I can go to the grocery store, I can get food many places for our animal and insects, they can't. So I don't want to take from them. So um, same thing as if I'm leaving the same hike, I saw another little, little dandelion flower right at the edge at the end of the uh, trail I was on, and I was going to leave that as well. Um, so making sure you're not just grabbing the first thing you see and seeing if there's more of an abundance. Um, never take more than half. And so there's different rules of thumb with this. Uh, Samuel Thayer is a, a renowned forager in Wisconsin, and he often will say never take more than 20%. Um, and so um, in these cases, you really want to think about a couple of things. You want to make sure you're leaving enough for all the other, our critter kin that need it. And also, do you, what are you going to do with it? Because it is work to forage food, and it's good rewarding work, but are you going to take out a ton of stinging nettle and then it's going to rot in your fridge or dry somewhere and you're going to forget about it? Um, so that's something to keep in mind too, is never take more than half or never take more than 20%. And also don't take more than you actually personally need yourself. So you might need way less than 20% of a giant patch of stinging nettle or a giant patch of dandelions. Um, so just thinking about those two things. Um, Let's see, uh, harvesting in a way that minimizes harm, that kind of loops back if you know the plant, how can I actually take this in a way that it's not gonna damage um, future harvests as well? So really kind of diving in and getting to know the plant better. Um, harvest respectfully. So really that's again, a slow process. So not just going in and ripping, but that you're talking to the plant, you're introducing yourself, you're seeing how the plant feels. And then very gently with hands, with scissors, sometimes with a little shovel, if you're maybe getting burdock root, but you're doing it in a way that's not aggressive and you're looking at what's growing around it. And just, if you just don't walk in and trample and you go slow, that will do a lot to minimize harm. Um, share. This is a huge one. Um, wild foods, we'll talk about preparation, but they also can go bad faster than our foods from the grocery store. And so there's nothing worse than, I, for me, like if I make a huge batch of violet syrup in the spring or dandelion syrup, and then it goes bad. So um, I will usually make it and then try and uh, share it with as many friends and neighbors, um, anyone I know that will be interested so that it's not going to waste. And it's just, it's a joy to see people 
get excited and say, you know, this bright yellow syrup came from a dandelion flower and um, just kind of share that experience. So never really trying to hoard, but also always, you know, letting other people enjoy what you've discovered. Um, giving thanks for what's been giving. There's different ways to do this. I always say thank you to the plant itself. Um, if I'm out, I usually have a bag with me to pick up any trash in the area. Um, I live in Chicago in East Garfield Park, but I also, um, a group of friends, we have um, land that we land steward together in McHenry County. And so in that way, I can really go in and um, do some land stewardship. But wherever I'm at, I try and pick up the trash. I try and say thank you. I try and forage in a way that's not aggressively ripping things up. And then also when I teach these classes or any of my other classes, I always give, if I make money, I give money to other places and people that are doing good work. Um, like some of the uh, cost of this class will go to um, Forest School, uh, Illinois for schools of Illinois. Um, and it's a school, it's run by indigenous youth through uh, Shy Nations Youth Council and it's outdoor forest school for kids um, and trying to find different organizations that are also working to um, educate people and do good work so that there's always that reciprocity forward. So there's tons of ways to say, to say thank you. There's not one right way to do it. Um, and those are all things to keep in mind. And so that's, to me, the gift is giving forward. It's a thank you and a gift. Um, I might water, I might, if I see like a little native plant trying to come up and there's a ton of garlic mustard around it, then I might pull up as much as I can to help that plant thrive. So you'll all find your ways to um, say thank you and give gifts back. Um, and so all of those things are, are what help sustain and keep keep things going for everyone. So maybe now uh, we can stop for a second. I'm gonna look in the Q&A. Oh, and so uh, and Beth is asking about chemicals. Um, are you meaning like uh, what we talked about with people spraying pesticides? Um, let me know if you type a little more in a little more detail. Um, and I'm looking over here for the, I think the handouts, um, Natalie can give you the handouts that have popped up. Um, you can get copies of those. Um, yes, yeah, so, and we have the book down. So let's see here. Um, so I'll circle back with Beth and we'll see if there's more details about the chemicals. Um, and so moving forward, oh, hold on here, I see. Um, Oh, gosh, that's a good question about organizations. Um, forest schools um, for Illinois, and I may, hopefully Jennifer and Natalie will be, if you Google it, it's, I forget if it's, um, there's fraternal forest play school, I think, and for, forest schools of Illinois are great. Um, I teach a, a, a plant class for families. So I have one coming up. It's in the city, but it's on oak trees. And we learn about one plant in detail through creative play and music and art. Um, there's a ton of great books, which I might have to um, brainstorm on. If they pop up, I will try and remember. Um, but also if you go into um, your local forest preserves, oftentimes, or any sort of nature centers in your area, they typically will have programs as well for, for kids as well. Oh yes, oh, Jennifer's got it. Um, oh yeah, why the elbow and not the back of your hand? That's a good question. I think from, I don't know in too much detail, my teacher, uh, Pat that talked about it. I, that's just traditionally where it is. I think part of it is if for some reason you did have a rash, it's easier to deal with it here than if it's here. Um, it's not as unsightly, I guess, or uh, just you can put your sleeve down and it's out of the way. Uh, but I don't know besides that versus back of your hand. I think partly just, um, and sometimes, I mean, our hands are a little more, they're, they're maybe a little less sensitive than the skin here. So just around the elbow area, th those are the answers I have for that. But yeah, that's a good question. Um, so maybe what we can do, let me just dive back here really quick. Um, yeah, 
Oh yes, good question. So partly the chemicals and spraying. So um, yeah, the making sure if you know the history or can get the soil tested. Um, there are organizations that will do free soil testing too. Um, you can pay to have your soil tested if you're wanting that to, to forage around any area that you would have access to. Um, but yeah, keeping an eye on that, but also, you know, you have all sorts of, you have, if you're foraging in the city, you might have dog urine um, or, or poop, or you might have deer urine and all these lovely things. So what I'll, I'll, we're gonna talk about these later, but these are all things that I foraged over the weekend. Um, and I will typically wash them uh, twice and then dry them. Um, you can get like little, the same veggie wash. Some people will use that and just, you know, put a little bit of that and use a, a salad spinner. There's all sorts of things. I will also sometimes just pick and eat as I go. Um, oh gosh, there's an old teacher of mine uh, would say, uh, try and eat something, you know, wild every day. So it's, you know, again, it's your level of what you feel comfortable with, but you can just like you, if you would wash veggies or you're worried about like, who's been tromping over it or, or, or peeing, um, usually a, a couple good washes with water. And then you can use, I use the, it's a bio clean produce wash. Um, and I'll put some of that on. If I'm making food for others, I always give everything a, a bit of a, of a solid washing. Uh, if I uh, do an outdoor um, plant walk where people get to try the various foods, um, that's all been washed. So yeah, good question for sure. Let's see here. Um, so maybe we can go into um, another great way that you can start to forage and do it ethically is to start on non-native species or invasive species um, because there tends to be quite a bit of them and you can pick till your heart's content and uh, it's not usually going to affect the next harvest. Um, and so the thing to keep in mind with these are, um, all plants are just plants and they're just doing what they know how to do. Um, and we were talking a little bit about this before class opened up. We, people can really hate like, oh, garlic mustard. And you know, it's, it does, it, it can really take over a, a forest floor. Um, and, and we tend to really like, oh, I hate that plant. Um, but the thing we forget is that almost all non-native plants, especially if you're from European descent, they were brought here by human hand. They were loved somewhere and someone said, oh, I'm gonna take them. Uh, and then they had no natural, it wasn't their environment. So they were doing what they do, but in a new space. So we also have to acknowledge that most of the invasive things that we are, uh, we get mad about is that we were the people responsible for them. Um, and so this is a good way to uh, kind of rebuild a relationship with these plants that often can take over. Um, almost all of them, uh, especially plants that we call weeds are uh, medicinal and or edible. Um, and so, you know, a native plant is just a plant that is indigenous to that area. A non-native plant came from somewhere else and now grows in that area. Um, and then we have invasive species are the non-native plants that, um, are in a non, they're in a new area, but they're aggressively taking over. And a weed is just a plant we don't want. We, we put a, a, you know, our space together and it just said, hey, I wanna grow here. And we're like, we don't want you here. And they just showed up. But here's the thing is they're all plants and their, their titles can change depending on who you talk to and where they live, right? So um, a weed to someone is highly desirable to someone else. So the same kind of concept as you, especially if you're foraging in your place or you're working with your weeds, you can still be like, oh, I didn't want you to be here, um, but find a way to remove them or work with them. Um, and maybe some of them get pulled out and end up in compost or whatever you do, but maybe some also end up on your dinner table. Um, um, and there's various other ways to connect. So uh, non-native species tend to be very profuse. Um, so maybe if Natalie can pull up, we'll start with dandelion. I mean, and I'm sure you all am, can imagine a dandelion, but we just have a picture of a dandelion. Um, but dandelions are a great starting point for several reasons. They, uh, you can eat them year round. You can eat the whole thing, the flower head, the stem, the leaves and the root. So dandelions are a great wild edible to know. They're easy to find. Um, they grow almost everywhere. 
uh, they're most, the leaves are very, very bitter. Um, and so they're, they're, they have a lot of vitamin C in them, but they are uh, maybe not palatable for everyone, but you can cook them down. There's um, a lot of like the, my uh, friend's mom is from Lebanon and there's a spicy dandelion green. You'll see in a lot of cultures where you would, would wash and boil the dandelions um, and kind of blanch them and then cook them with garlic and it takes out the bitterness. Uh, the flower heads in the springtime, um, I often use them to make a Scandinavian dandelion syrup recipe that involves about 40 flower heads of the dandelion and some apples um, and sugar. And you just boil those, those petals and it creates this really vibrant yellow syrup that you can put on pancakes. Um, I've had friends where they've mixed them into drinks with whiskey. So there's a variety of things you can do with that. The leaves often I will put in salad or I will drink in tea. And then dandelion root is a coffee substitute that is used um, frequently with chicory as a coffee replacement. I think even if you go to somewhere like Whole Foods now, you can find, uh, I want to say the brand is Tea Chino, but they have like there's a couple, there's dandy blend, and it's just mostly dandelion and chicory root. So here's something that, that's growing everywhere that you have access to and can um, eat year round uh, if you can find them. You have to dig under the snow sometimes in, in December and January to find them, but they're usually down there. So dandelions are great. Um, and then we have, let's see if we can bring up red clover. We're kind of getting to the end of the red clover period. Uh, it's the tallest of the of the clovers that grow in this area. Um, and it has those kind of reddish pink blossoms. And so red clover, you can use the flower petals and salad. Um, and then often this is dried and used as tea. Uh, it has, um, I drink it a lot. It's a good tea. Uh, it's kind of a, a anti-cancer tea that people will use. Um, and you can have the leaves as well. Uh, the littler clovers, the alcyc clover and white clover are also edible. They don't have a ton of flavor. So this red clover, the blossom itself has the most flavor. Um, you wouldn't need a ton of this. It would be kind of like sprinkled, thinking of it as like an herb across your dishes. But another pretty common in Illinois, uh, definitely in the city and the su suburban area that you can find, uh, just usually by kind of walking around. And we're at the telltale end. I have some growing in um, our garden beds out back, but um, I'll show you mine. They're, they're actually kind of white because they're, they're losing color. It's at the end of their life. Um, and then we have uh, Creeping Charlie or Ground Ivy. This is another one people love or hate. Um, it spreads quite profusely, uh, but Creeping Charlie, you can also use um, a lot of people will say like a pot herb, um, or I always say the way you would use like um, an, like oregano. And it has kind of, it's in the mint family. It has kind of a, an earthy, minty flavor I'm quite fond of. I think it's good on chicken or fish. You sprinkle it on the top. Um, in one of my classes, when I took the class at the Resiliency Institute, we had to prepare wild food dishes all the time. And someone brought in coconut milk ice cream and sprinkled Creeping Charlie across the top. Um, this is also a good one if you are um, having like a very wet cough or dealing with bronchitis, um, having some Creeping Charlie in your soup um, or having a tincture of Creeping Charlie can be helpful if you have that really wet cough that's, um, you're trying to get over that, getting the, the phlegm out of the lungs. Um, and then the last is plantain, which I love and is mentioned in um, braiding sweetgrass. So this is a plant that came over, it grows in Europe and Asia, but it settled in nicely. So it's not native to North America, Turtle Island, but it, it settled in and didn't kind of take over. So this is broadleaf plantain. Um, and if you see the little seedling, um, that is psyllium. So that when you get stuff like metamucil, this is the wild origins of that. Um, so it's a very fibrous plant, but it's a good one. I always say if you've eaten like a really delicious burrito, 
but you're, you're having a hard time digesting it. Your body's a little bit like, Whoa, what did we do? Um, any good meal you had that's like making you have a little, um, tummy upset afterward, chewing up, uh, one or two plantain leaves will help settle your stomach. Um, and then, uh, if you want to take that down, I will show you one of my other favorite things with plantain. Um, and I harvest some yesterday and I don't, I'm still trying to find, um, I know plantain is the, um, it's old French. Um, and I don't know why this plantain has the same name as the banana, but they do. So yeah, you can take this slide down. Um, the other thing plantain is really great for is uh, the compounds in the plant have their anti-inflammatory. So it's excellent for uh, bee and wasp stings um, or any, if you cut yourself. Um, and so uh, when I was on our community land in McHenry, uh, we have an old deserted truck and there were some beer bottles in the back uh, that had probably been sitting there for some time. And the wasps were going in and drinking the uh, fermented beer. And so I, I feel like they were extra um, wasps. They need a lot of personal space to begin with, but they were just angry. <laughs> we, we think they were drunk on the beer, but I reached my hand over and immediately got stung three times um, and my thumb swole up and I just looked down on the ground and I found some plantain. So this is broadleaf plantain. So if you suddenly have a sting, you just take a leaf and you chew it again. Uh, you want the saliva and the enzymes to kind of work their way out of the leaf. And then if I have the sting there, I put it on to where the wasp sting was. And then you can take another leaf. This one is a little, um, but if you cut, you just kind of try and rip a little hole kind of towards the center, you can wrap it. This one's not quite, my, my thumb is too big, but with some, you can wrap it around and make a Band-Aid. And the relief is um, pretty quick. It really takes the sting out. If, if anyone's been stung by a wasp, it is not fun. Um, so this will really take a lot of that sting out of it. So it's another lovely plant that you can find everywhere. Um, there's the broad leaf, and then this is also narrow leaf. They're both, you can use either one. Um, and then this is their, maybe if I hold up, you can see a little better. This is the psyllium. So this is the seedling that comes out. So these can be dried and the seeds can be put into things like smoothies for some extra fiber. Um, so let me see, I'm gonna circle back here and see if there's more questions. Oh yeah, you can plant, uh, uh, Beth is asking, you can plant ramps in your yard. They like kind of a shady area, but you can get the seeds. That's another lovely way is to start start planting. Um, on our land, we, we've been trying to plant ramps. Um, so yeah, looking up and making sure you have an area where they would grow, but you can definitely grow your own. And that's, that's a great way to kind of um, enjoy them and also uh, give them time to kind of grow and reproduce. Let's see here. Um, let's see. Oh yeah, and plantain will work for mosquito bites as well if they're feeling very itchy. Um, and the other thing, like if you cut, like you you um, cut your knee or and you don't have a band aid, um, you're out kind of in a more remote area. Chewing up that plantain and putting it on that open cut um, will be helpful too, till you can get somewhere where you can get a, a band aid and put it on. So let's see. Um, other questions, why don't we go into, so with, with foraging, um, you are just harvesting is, is a small part of, of what happens. The next is then what you do when you get home. Cause it's, you know, not quite like going to the store and then just sticking it in the fridge. Sometimes you can, but there's a lot of methods in, uh, preparing wild foods. So with knowing the plant, another thing you want to keep in mind is certain plants like plantain, you can eat it raw or you can eat it cooked. Um, other plants, Creeping Charlie, you can eat it raw or you can eat it cooked. Um, some like milkweed, which is edible, you would only want to have milkweed cooked. You would never want to eat it raw. Um, you will just get a very upset stomach. And so partly is knowing 
how to prepare it once you get it home. Um, and so this is, and you can use this with your uh, cultivated herbs at home and a lot of plants as well, but the methods you typically use to um, prepare your, your wild foods is you can eat them raw and make a salad. You can cook them into things and then you can dry them or you use salt, vinegar, or oil to preserve them. And so drying is the easiest. So you can kind of see it. Here's my drying rack over here. The season is, is coming down. So I just have a little rack on the wall where things are drying. And it's kind of a combination of herbs that I grow. So I have lamb's quarters on there and yarrow that are harvested wildly but there's also sage from my garden and peppers. And so um, just having a place to put them up when, uh, I'm gonna scoot over here for a sec. <laughs> so when it's spring and summer and I'm really harvesting, I will, I have these big nets, these drying racks. And so if I'm harvesting like quite a bit of stinging nettles, I can bring them home wash them and then just lay them out to let them dry in here and it just hangs from the ceiling and there I actually have a, there's a whole nother section so there's eight eight areas to dry various plants on um, and so that's a pretty easy method is just you can hang them up to dry or hang them in a, a mesh container like this um, the one culprit is is time and dust so you I am really good at forgetting things so I will put a timer on my phone often or on my calendar that's like, hey, check on your herbs. Um, it, just because then if you, they've been sitting for three months and there's a layer of house dust over them, probably not the end of the world, but also not super great. So usually it's gonna be a week or two. Um, some you can dry in paper bags. Um, so having something like that on hand. So drying, super easy way to collect plants and then dry them. And so after they're dry, com commonly you're gonna use them for tea um, or like you would oregano or rosemary to cook into food. Um, this is the end of my red clover. Um, and so I forage, and you can see it's almost white now. Um, I forage in my uh, backyard or actually it's back garden beds which are um, mostly intentionally wild plants that are growing there. Um, and then I forage at the urban farm up the street. I forage in the parks in the city. And then I forage on our land in um, McHenry County. It's in Wonder Lake. It's, it's kind of the closest town to where it's at. Um, and so you'll kind of find areas. But so this is from my, my back pad and my containers, my clovers at the end. This is what the flowers look like dried. And so I have made a herbal infusion with this. So this has got red clover in it. The difference between a cup of tea and an infusion is um, infusions, you're using more plant material and you're letting it sit for four to eight hours typically. Um, so it's more concentrated. So there's more, more minerals in particular in it. So this I'll strain. Um, and then I'll actually keep the red, this, it's about this much red clover in it. Um, I will uh, strain it out and then drink what's in here and fill it up again. And then the next day I'll drink what's in here again. Then I'll fill it up a third time and I'll let it sit for a few days. The third pour, um, so two pours I drink, the third pour goes to my plants inside and out because it has a lot of nutrients in it and then it goes into the compost. So it's also a nice way to think about not wasting the plant material. Um, so some you might be drying for, for teas, things of that nature. Then you have your vinegars, oils, and salts. Um, so with vinegar, typically you can use a white vinegar. I often use you know apple cider vinegar um, and you use this a lot for roots. And so um, this here is from my back, yard. This is nodding onion. Um, and so it's a native plant and nodding onion, it's, it's, but it's at the end of its life. And I had, it was getting too, too tightly clustered together. So I needed to get some of the nodding onion out. And maybe some of you gardeners or people know these are, are bright purple uh, last month, but not so much now. So what I'm going to do is just kind of use scissors and cut this up. And then I'm gonna put it into a container with the apple cider vinegar 
um, and let it sit for about six weeks in this cabinet behind me where it's nice and dark and try and remember to shake it up on occasion. Uh, and then I will strain the plant material out and then I will have a um, kind of oniony vinegar that I will usually mix in to make in a salad dressing or you know, soak different, different foods in the way you would use a vinegar to cook with. Um, so vinegar does well with garlic mustard. Uh, the root of garlic mustard makes a really delicious vinegar. Um, you, a lot of roots are usually better for that. Um, but you can even use things like uh, magnolias in the spring. The magnolia blossom makes a lovely vinegar um, that you can cook with. And um, you can use that for a facial toner too. You will smell like salad dressing. The other thing I'll, I'll use vinegar for, I make a homemade um, bug spray that, uh, well, no one wants to be around me, not a bug or anyone else, but it's uh, catnip, yarrow, soaked in apple cider vinegar. Um, and you do you smell like, it's like really bad salad dressing, but the bugs tend to leave you alone when you spray that down. Um, so vinegar is a great preservative and it will last um, it, indefinitely with vinegars. Like I, I, I'm, I usually will mark things, but uh, usually at least three to six months, if you're keeping it in your fridge, maybe longer. Uh, when you are making something, always write down what it is, let me tell you, because you'll be like, I won't forget. And then you won't remember what day or time. So if I'm, when I make that, I'm gonna write nodding onion vinegar made today, today's date I think is the, the third, 10, 10 three, um, so that I know uh, and it, it's not sitting forever in the back and what's inside. Because sometimes I have to play a game where I thought I wrote it down, didn't, and I have all these weird brews where I have to smell and taste and figure out what I'm making. So a Sharpie and a label or write down what you're making. Um, let me stop really quick. And before we go on, cause I saw a few, um, Oh, so plantain, um, I, I like the way it tastes, but it just is kind of like a little bit of a, it would taste maybe similar to like a romaine lettuce, it, like a green, like any kind of green you would have in a salad. It's just very chewy. So you kind of have to, to chew it a little bit longer, um, but it, it doesn't have an unpleasant taste, kind of an earthy green taste. So you could try that and see, um, see what you like. And if, if worst case, if you um, uh, spit it out. It's not the end of the world. Um, oh yes. Boiling. Good, good question. Yes. So you, I also have my, uh, teapot, which is hiding over here, but I it's boiled water. So, um, I have a little measure. I it's about, um, oh gosh, 10, uh, ounces of plant material and then filling it up with hot water and letting it sit. So yeah, you definitely need, the, it's just like you would make tea, but more plant material and longer. Um, and uh, if you look up um, uh, how to make herbal infusions, there's some, it's all, it's old, old herbalism. Um, it'll, it'll pop up and I have not found any that haven't, have, will really lead you astray. Um, but you can do a ton of different infusions that way. Uh, let's see here, let me see. Um, yeah, so then just to show you, so vinegar is one way to preserve. And then we have oil. Um, I usually use olive oil. So one thing I'm gonna make, uh, we're kind of at the end of the season, but this is all plantain. I'm gonna make an oil out of the plantain. Uh, this is again, especially good for cuts, bruises or cuts, burns and bites. So I, I always have bug bites on me. This is always an exciting part of the year where the bug bites are going to start falling by the wayside. But I, I have a ton of, I think it was the mosquitoes were trying to get everything in before it gets colder because I got attacked while we were camping yesterday. So what I will typically do, and actually I'm going to just move this here so you can see, um, is often I'll just use scissors. And I'm gonna take my plant material. Um, and then I, this, this is the jar I had on hand. So I always use what is on hand. Um, and I just kind of cut the plant into the jar. And so you're just, you're, you're making sure to kind of get it so that it's not, you could probably just put the plant in and over time it would, um, 
be fine, but just cutting or chopping it is helpful. So then the plant is in there and then you just take the olive oil. This one takes a little bit of time, but you just wanna make sure it's covered to the top. Um, and then same thing with this. Um, you're gonna cover it with the olive oil and write that you have plantain in here and the date that you put it together. And then it's also going to sit in a dark, cool place for six weeks. Um, if you can remember to shake it, that can be helpful too. If you do not remember to shake it, it's typically not the end of the world. Um, and so I'm just covering everything up here. That's almost done. Um, some people to um, preserve the life of the lids when they're using what it, bell jars or any variation of is they'll put wax, wax paper in between the lid and the jar. And that, especially if you're using vinegar, that can be helpful because it won't eat the jar um, and you'll have your jars a little longer. But so it's covered up and then I'm just going to Remember again, I will write afterwards, but making sure that you have the lid on and you can have that wax paper seal if you need, and then just shake it. And then again, for me, it's just gonna go, I have sort of a space here in the back and I'm gonna put it back in there. Um, and then I'm also going to put a reminder on my calendar to say it's back there so that I, remember to, to check in on it. Uh, but that's again, easy to do. Um, you can do this with um, a lot of different plants. Um, if you're again, cultivated like rosemary that makes a delicious, beautiful oil that you can cook with or make salad dressings with. So this one you could cook with it. Um, I'll also like blend it in with balsamic vinegar and make a salad dressing, uh, maybe a little garlic, but it also, if I am like where you're really covered in bug bites or stings, like after I get out of the shower, I might put the plantain oil on to help with the itch factor and help, um, it helps with inflammation. So it gets the redness down. So we have um, oil and then another simple one is salt. And so here I have, this is Creeping Charlie that I harvested um, at our friend's place where we were camping yesterday in central Illinois. Um, it's a little warmer down there. So it's there, everything was still really fresh and vibrant. So for this one, I'm just gonna do kind of a similar thing. Um, I, again, you, you can cut or you can um, use your knife, but you just basically want to make sure that you're, you're kind of chopping up the plant material and opening it up. Um, and I might even just kind of twist it a little bit and same concept, I'm gonna put it in, but this time I'm gonna use salt. So I'm gonna kind of smash it down a little bit. And then I just, I have my salt. You can use whatever salt you'd like. Uh, and then I'm gonna pour the salt into it, kind of let it get down into the plant, maybe shake a little bit and then I'm gonna add more. Doing the same thing and then covering it up. And again, you can do, I often with my um, cultivated herbs will make uh, a, a salt with rosemary, oregano and thyme where it's all in here, uh, where I'll just cut them from the yard and then pour them in salt. And then it just sits by our oven. And I, whenever I feel like it's a good seasoning to cook with, it's there. Um, but now Creeping Charlie's gonna have that kind of like a, uh, a, a little bit of a sweeter minty oregano, but I'll just have it here. And same thing, write the date on. Even, um, and I'll talk about the, the, the plant here in a second. So, and then just shake it and same thing, you're just gonna let it sit to the side. Um, with this, you just wanna make sure, so, uh, when you're harvesting, if possible, if you can harvest on a dry morning, that's, that's beneficial. Um, but sometimes you don't have the time to do that and you're gonna get your plants when they're a little wet from rain. So I harvest these after a rain yesterday, but I just laid them out on a cloth napkin so they could dry. So it's okay that the, the moisture that's in the plant 
when you cut and chop is not going to affect the salt so much, but you don't want to put it, put the whole plant in wet. So letting it be dry before you do it. Same thing with the vinegar and the oil is, is using dry plant material. Um, we'll just make things easier. Now let's see here. Let me check and see. Um, yeah. Oh, so take your, can you take your herbs at a later date by freezing them in olive oil and cutting them up? Yep. Um, and putting them in a large, yeah, that is another great way to do it too. Just like you would with the little garlic or certain things. Also a nice, you can freeze. Um, and freezing is great. I, a lot of times you want to blanch it. So um, this is on its last leg, but this is lamb's quarter, which is also sometimes called goosefoot or wild spinach. The leaves are pretty dry. I just dry these and then add them to soup. Um, but I will also um, cut down a lot and then boil it really just briefly for a minute or two. And then, so I'll blanch it and then put it in the freezer. And then I can use it like frozen spinach throughout the winter. So freezing is another great way to preserve. Um, a lot of times you might just want to blanch the plant before you put it into its, its if you just put it in um, after you harvest it, it won't keep as well as if you blanch it. But yeah, that's a great way to, to save, save those plants. Um, so yes, I'm sorry guys. So, so the questions just, um, just to keep, and apologies for the ones that I missed there. Um, so Beth was asking, how do ramps differ from chives? And so ramps are, um, so uh, the if you look at the plant itself, the leaves are, are bigger and wider. Um, so knotting onion, oftentimes this would get more like a green onion or like a chive. There's more similarity, it may be in look and taste. Um, Ramps are, I mean, they're so delicious. They're, they're, it's like maybe a, a more like a sweet green onion, but it's not quite that, um, that, that the taste would be like, but so the, the bulb is larger um, and the leaves themselves. Uh, oftentimes people will say, oh, it looks like tulips. Like sometimes I'll be in the, the woods with kids and they'll say like, oh, or it's just two leaves that, that are popping up. And so it often it's like you mentally want to see a little flower appear almost or like a tulip. Um, so the leaves are wider themselves. Um, and so, yeah, good. Uh, so Beth is also asking, how do you prevent molding in the oil um, so that it doesn't go rancid? So if you're putting the plant in dry and making sure that it's completely covered, oil is up to the top and the plant is fully submerged in the oil, uh, then it will keep it from molding. Um, but it's good, you know, you can, I'll usually check every week, like open and peek and make sure things are looking well. Um, I have, I think when I was, was first starting, I put, I was too eager and I put in um, some plants that were wet and I, I had a bit of a, but you'll, it'll smell, it should smell just like the plant. So like when I make my rosemary oil and I open it, um, that's what you just smell. Like you can smell the olive oil, but you'll, you'll smell if it's off, but yeah, working with a dry plant really can make a difference with that. Um, let's see here. Um, Oh yeah, uh, and let's see, I'm looking, uh, let's see here uh, with, yeah, I, um, when I, I do cook and eat plantain, um, oftentimes I might put some leaves in with a salad at dinner time, um, or I will, I'll chop up the leaves and put them into a soup on occasion. Um, that's primarily how I use them, but the, the way I typically use plantain the most is just like, if my stomach is feeling a little off is I'll, I have some growing up back and I'll just go take a couple leaves and chew them and eat them or if I get stung. Um, but yeah, you can, you can cook it into, um, you can make salads or cook it into soups, things of that nature. Um, let's see, and Beth is mentioning bell jars now have plastic lids for storage and that definitely, we have some of those too, that can be helpful as well um, in keeping the, 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 the acid eating the, the jar lid. Let's see. Um, uh, yeah, I keep, when I do the rosemary, I, I usually just, um, 
if I'm depending on the jar I'm using, uh, I'll use the stem as well. I'll just kind of cut it up so that it fits into the jar, but um, I'll include the stem with it. Let's see. Um, other questions? I think you're caught up, Natalie, but if everybody has questions moving forward, please do try to use the Q&A feature in the bottom right. It's a little bit easier for Natalie to see um, while, she's, while she's working through everything. I was gonna show you a, a couple other things and then to the books that are helpful. Um, this, I, it's my kitchen lighting's a little weird, but this is crab apple and hawthorn um, jelly. Uh, and so if you've seen that, you know, crab apples and the hawthorns are starting to drop, they're, the little fruits are edible. Um, they're extremely tart. So um, now if you're going to forage hawthorn and crab apple, you usually would always want to take them home and boil them. And so, um, and then strain them to make uh, fruit leathers, jams, or jellies. That makes a really nice tart, um, sweet jelly. I like to say that, that crab apples are nature's Sour Patch Kid. My kids do not agree with me. They think Sour Patch Kids are way better, but um, especially larger crab apples can be quite delicious. Um, but because they're so, they will pucker your lips. Uh, crab apples, you can eat the whole thing. But again, going back to knowing your plant, hawthorns, you want to make sure you do not eat the seed of the hawthorn or it will cause stomach indigestion. And so um, knowing they can sometimes get looped together, their leaves are a little bit different, um, but that's something you can look for and forage right now. The other thing you can do is it's a great winter food. So um, if you can come across a crab apple tree where the little apples are uh, withered on the, on the tree itself. That's called bletting. Um, and they basically ferment onto the tree and they, they are very sweet at that point. So my favorite thing to do is, is just eat them off the tree in winter. Um, if you hear stories where people are talking about raccoons or moose being drunk, it's from them eating too many fermented crab apples um, or hawthorns because you know they they I, I think for a human it would take us a lot to get to that point but people think the raccoon has rabies because it's acting weird and it's just drunk on crab apples so crab apples are in season um, and hawthorns and then the other thing is um, you can dive all of this into foraging but the other thing is a lot of the plants have purposes. Um, they can be made into fiber. They can be made into paper. They can be woven into baskets. So the other thing that I tend to do is I have these are sunflower heads that have dried up. Um, and once there, you know, I just kind of will get down to the flower head itself. You can use this as a scrubby for dishes. So we have a, um, a, a feral cat that's been um, trapped and released, but she's too wild and does not want to live inside. She's our alley matriarch that runs the alley. Um, and uh, her food dishes, she also kind of gets infections a lot. And so we, when we clean her dishes, um, I use these. So she has her own little scrubby and we're not using the sponges that we use on our dishes. Um, but if you're in a pinch, the flower head of a, a sunflower, you can use for that. Um, horse chestnuts, you can uh, boil and use the liquid for uh, laundry detergent. So even past eating, a lot of the things we think of um, have other purposes besides just um, to be eaten or not. Other questions? Let's see, I've got some here. Um, oh, okay, so Mary's asking for salt. Uh, use kosher salt or any, any non-iodized salt you can use. So you can, if you want a fine grain, if you want it more coarse, um, but really any salt, uh, Himalayan salt, like any anything that comes to mind. You can get fancy and sometimes mixed in like smoked salts. Um, there's a plant I can't think of, um, oh gosh. It's, it's uh, I think it's originally from India. And it's used a lot in curries, but uh, we made um, a salt and it turned the salt a pretty uh, purple. I can't think of the name if any, anyone knows. Um, if it comes to me, I'll try and remember. Um, let's see, and Beth is asking, I've been using a dehydrator. Does the, fla uh, the flavor stay the same? Oh, so that, that's then if it did with cooking. That's a great question. Um, 
It, not quite, uh, but dehydrators can be great. You can also sometimes use a dehydrator to dry your plants out quicker than just letting them hang dry. Um, so uh, it would be kind of like, so with lamb's quarters or wild spinach, if you thought about like, if you took spinach and you dehydrated it, how it would taste versus um, if you like um, ate it in a salad versus if you like grilled it or um, steamed it. So same plant, slightly different flavors, but you can work with it. So um, people will use like the dehydrator to um, make a uh, lamb's quarter, like roast it, like you would have uh, a kale chip but you're using the wild spinach instead. So you can definitely play around with it. And it just like any other plants, it'll change the flavor. Um, so yeah, and so any Native American foragers, naturalists that teach classes in the Chicago area, um, I, I would say, I, I wish there were more and um, I would connect to the Shy Nations Youth Council. Um, and they are, uh, they're doing a lot of great work. I, I there's, there are many, many native people doing this, um, but like hosting and teaching classes uh, regularly, uh, maybe less so. Um, Linda Black Elk is a great ethnobotanist to follow. She's based in South Dakota, but she posts a lot of great information about plants um, and foraging. Um, so um, Shine Nations, they also run, um, they, they're working with the forest schools. So maybe in that situation, they're taking kids out where kids would be learning daily. Um, and they do have a First Nations garden in Albany Park and they'll have events there um, and uh, they're phenomenal. And so um, if you follow them and try and see when they have things, um, they have a three sisters garden that they're working on and um, everybody uh, that's a part of that group is really passionate and sweet. Um, so that's a good local spot. Um, I'm trying to think the Trickster Museum might be another place that they might have some ethnobotany foraging uh, classes to look into. Um, and this is the thing that's that's hard sometimes with, um, for me, I grew up with the Navajo people in the Southwest. Um, and when, when you learn from people to always acknowledge where things came from, because there's a long history with indigenous people of sharing their practices. And then like maybe a, a, an elder teaches me a, a tea that really helps with, with the flu. And so what happens often is then I learn from this person and then I take it and I make the tea and then I'm on Instagram or I'm out there saying, hey, come get my special tea. It's $40 a package. Um, and so sometimes there's a level of building relationships that um, there's a long history of, of taking things. People have been taking a lot. Um, and so finding ways to um, study with there's, um, I'm trying to think, in a, in a respectful way and always, always acknowledging where your information came from. Um, there's a per, uh, um, indigenous permaculture retreat that happens in August in South Dakota as well. Um, that's really worth the trip where they spend a week where you learn in indigenous land stewardships. Um, so that's something to look into. And if I think of more, maybe I can tell Jennifer and Natalie, but that's a, it's a really, really great question. Um, so, um, but always, you know, trying to acknowledge who you study under and learn from and, and um, maybe not always try to turn everything into a profit too. Um, yeah, oh, thank you. So uh, Anna Maria is saying this would be a great hands-on series of classes for the uh, new marketplace. I think we were talking about um, trying to do this in person um, at the library, uh, but of course uh, we're still kind of up in the air, but hopefully it, it would be great to have um, be in the uh, maker's lab where people could come and put things into oils and vinegars and salts and, and do that as well. Um, we're on our community land, we're planning on doing foraging classes next year where people can come out and forage too, because really being able to do that does make a big difference. Um, Oh yeah, Trickster, uh, Jennifer's got some good, uh, they're a great, uh, yeah, the Cultural Center, um, they're wonderful too.
Okay, let's see. So I wanted to mention uh, books that are, are good to reference when you're learning about all of this. There's Braiding Sweetgrass, of course, um, which isn't a book about foraging, but um, it, it is, and it, you know, that's where the honorable harvest comes from. But this, I feel like, is such an essential book to help us remember um, that we're a part of the earth and um, it's important that we have that love and reciprocity with it that sometimes it can be easy to forget about and lose. Um, so this is just a beautiful book all around, but you will learn a lot about plants from reading it. So um, highly, highly recommend this. Also, because she is Potawatomi, especially for the area we're living in, you're going to, to learn more about indigenous practices here. Um, so Braiding Sweetgrass is great. Um, I also highly, if you like audiobooks, she reads it and it's um, a lovely listen. Um, I don't recommend reading it before you have to go to meetings where you end up crying because you, the passage is so beautiful. And then you show up with red puppy eyes because I've done that more than once. Um, so Braiding Sweetgrass is a great book. Uh, and then this one is Peterson's Field Guide uh, for um, Edible Wild Plants. And so it's, it's, a, it's kind of a short one. Um, so this is one that goes in my backpack a lot. And uh, it has a wealth of information, but maybe not the most exact. So uh, if you page through it, you're, it's just like each of these are a plant. So it, it covers a lot of ground. But Samuel Thayer, the forager in Wisconsin, whose books I'll talk about here in a second, he says that books like these are put together by um, armchair foragers. So people who do not actually go out and forage, they kind of go on Google and just grab information and say, okay, that's edible that way. Um, and so this is one that it's a light, easy thing to pack, um, but I'll usually back this up if I'm looking for something wild with um, a couple other, I won't go off of just this book for uh, if something is edible or not and try and dive into more detail, but it's a handy one to get in your backpack. Um, then there's Midwest Foraging. So this is put together by uh, Lisa M. Rose, and it's focused on a lot of things. We have hazelnuts on the cover there. Um, lots of plants that are in the Midwest. So here we have ground cherries, um, and it's pretty simple. So there, there isn't a ton of illustrations, but she does go through um, kind of uh, how to identify it, when and where to gather, how to gather, um, how to eat. And one of the things I really like about her book is she talks about future harvests. So there's a little side note of like how you can harvest without um, causing harm. So we have Midwest Foraging. And then um, we have Samuel Thayer's books. We have uh, Nature's Garden and The Forager's Harvest. And so um, he has been foraging since he was a kid. I forget which book, um, but one of the introductions is about his mom pleading with him to stop going out and eating all these different things. But he is someone that actually really has spent time cooking with the plants and working with them. So there's less, um, less info on, there, there's not a lot of plants in these two books, but what there is is in great detail. So here we have one on lotus. But even uh, processing acorns, there's like 40 pages. And so you're really going to get into the nuts and bolts of different, um, oh, here's the acorns right here, um, the different types of wild food. So he really will dive through what the plant looks like, what the plant looks like through the different seasons, what part of the plant is edible at different points in the season, how it tastes, how to cook with it. So tons of details. So these I use a lot to kind of really dive into more. Um, and then when I do my plant classes, again, always trying to acknowledge um, the way uh, plants are used in different communities. Um, and so this one, Iwagara, which I, I'm butchering the title, is The Kinship of Plants and People. So this is an, a book written by a native ethnobotanist. And so it's a lovely book. And so this book is going to dive in let me find a good page. It will talk about how certain plants are edible, but it's also going to tell the story. So we have um, Joe Pieweed. Um, so it's going to talk about um, how it's used for medicine, 
how it's used to eat and also what other things the plant might be used for if it's creating and making different things and just general relationships of animals and humans to the plant. So this is a, another really lovely book. And then I also like, this is more medicinal, but also I think a very wonderful and helpful book, Working the Root. And so this one is over 400 years of traditional African-American healing. So there's gonna be a lot of recipes with plantain in this and different, um, a lot of, um, plants that we think of as herbs that you can use medicinally. So this is a great book as well. And then this final book is absolutely beautiful. It's written by two foragers on the East Coast. It's called Foraging and Feasting, a field guide to wild foods and a cookbook. So this one, when you look at it, it has beautiful illustrations in the front, so to help you, you know, the old school identifications of plants. And then in the back, we have, um, there should be more, oh yeah, ice cream, sodas. They'll kind of break down a lot of different of the vinegars and things you can make. And then there's recipes like, um, what do we have here? Um, herbal truffles, and oftentimes wild shepherd or cottage pie, um, they'll kind of give you a basic recipe and then what wild foods you can insert into it. Um, so those are all really great ones. Um, oh, and there's one other, let me peek down here. It should be close by because I use it a lot. This is a cookbook, but this is also a great one. Um, the Sioux Chef's Indigenous Kitchen. And so, um, all of the recipes are using foods um, that are native to North America, Turtle Island. Um, he acknowledges that it might not be easy for you to access them. So if the recipe calls for something like sumac, he'll say, use lemon in place of. So um, it's also a nice one. There's some really delicious recipes in here. Um, and he'll also, if you can't get all of the ingredients for it through foraging or finding it in your, your local area, there are um, kind of workarounds too. So this is another great one. That's just purely a cookbook, but um, a great way to connect with plants that are native to here. All right, let's see. Um, oh, you know, and I, I can send, I just realized I forgot the, I have a book reference list. If you go to uh, my website, I have a reference. Oh, no, I don't. I'm updating my website. It's not on there. Um, but I can send the book list to Jennifer and Natalie too. So maybe if, if people need it, um, they, can, they can find them there. This and is my question, favorite. Natalie, is there a favorite independent bookseller that you have that you like to, that you find a good selection of these books or that you would recommend for browsing titles like the ones you're sharing? You know, for me in the city, um, I usually do women and children first. Um, and with this one, I just ordered, um, it was directly through him. Um, and uh, the other place some of them have come from uh, is their websites. So like Samuel Thayer, I ordered the books directly from him um, and off of his website, which is I think samuelthayer.com currently. It's gone through a couple changes. Um, and then the others actually all came from traveling and hiking, <laughs> uh, which my partner always say as soon as there's like the gift shop um, at like any um, little areas or nature centers is where a lot of uh, this I got in the Catskills when we were hiking um, from a little local spot in town. And um, this one was from, I, I think, the uh, I, one of and I can't remember if it was Governor Dodge or one of the other uh, their main kind of resource center places. So that's another place they'll often have. Um, a, a reminder of that too is um, that it's good to to check on the books with uh, Samuel Thayer's mentioning of the armchair foraging. Foraging has gotten extremely popular. Uh, there's a book that came out. I think a couple years ago called Tells from the Forager's Kitchen. And um, the woman that wrote it actually doesn't, doesn't work with plants or forages. She had a, she was an Instagram influencer um, and she made a cookbook 
but the uh, original cookbook was, uh, she, she did send around to people to um, have them review it. Uh, and there was a, um, a recipe for raw elderberries, which is not, not good. You always want to cook your elderberries and also to eat wild mushrooms raw, which is also not a good idea. Um, and so sometimes you really want to make sure the book is written by someone that has experience with plants and has spent some time with them. And it, it, it's harder because so many have come out now um, because it's trendier, but they don't always have the most solid information. So maybe look at the author's background. Um, if you're like, oh, this book looks interesting, um, make sure like there's a background in, in some sort of plant knowledge um, so that you're not, you're not making a raw elderberry smoothie and then spending the day close to the toilet um, and things like that. See, I'm see here. Oh, oh gosh. Um, for kids. So uh, Carol's asking, are there any books for kids? Um, there, there's a great board game called Wild Craft. That's a real, and it's actually good for everybody. It's fun. It's kind of like Candyland, but you're you're you start at your grandma's house and you're trying to get to a patch of berries and there's little things along the way, like you might fall and hurt yourself or, and there's different herbs if you're hungry. Um, so the wild craft board game is a great one. Um, and what am I, there's another, I think it's called a curious nature. I don't, my copy I have is loaned out to some kids. So, um, it's like curious nature or something like that, that has a little bit on foraging. Um, but yeah, that's a great question. I wish I had more, more available um, or things I could think of. But the uh, wild craft board game is a lot of fun, um, and and kids usually really like it. Let's see, um, trying to think. Any other questions? Natalie, you have kept up with an incredible amount of questions. We are so grateful to you for sharing everything. This oh, is such a big topic and clearly we could go on for longer. We do love the idea of bringing you to the Maker Place that opened um, just a few weeks ago, shortly before your presentation. Now that we know that we're open and in business, that'd be a great space for you. We'd love to put you in the kitchen and make some of these things together, absolutely. So thank you to yeah. Anna Maria who mentioned that earlier. Um, and we are about at time, so I don't want to be disrespectful of anybody's time, but Natalie, do you have any last words for our audience or? No, I just, I, I really appreciate everyone um, coming out today to, to talk about this and feel free to reach out to me if you have plant questions. It's my favorite when people send me pictures and say, what is this? Can I eat this? Or um, also if you, if you email me or say like, I, I, kids books that I, I will remember better and be able to send you resources. So it's my, one of my most favorite subjects. So you're not pestering me when you um, have questions about it. So I'm happy if people need to reach out and want more resources and referrals, I'm happy to send them your way. That is incredibly generous of you. So thank you everybody who attended today. It was a nice Sunday uh, to go ahead and have this information and, and, go into the winter months and come out in the spring ready to, to forage. Um, but we would love for you to stay in touch with Natalie since she is, is excited to engage with this. And thank you for being part of One Book, One Village. If you had not read Braiding Sweetgrass before today, we hope that this is spurring your interest in reading Braiding Sweetgrass, which we're doing for the next month. And we'll have an evening with the author, Robin Wall Kimmerer, later in the month. So thank you again to everybody, to Natalie, to Natalie at AHML and to our entire uh, audience and foragers to be today. Thank you. Thank you.